Hi everybody, Jeff Marr from STEM School Hounds Ranch and I'm here with Dan Levinson, secondary digital art teacher here at STEM School Hounds Ranch. And Dan, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate being here with you and everyone else. We're so lucky at STEM to have so many talented teachers who bring so much experience and skill uh, to the table in, in their classrooms and Dan is one of them. Before he joined STEM, uh, and I, I should say that you continue to do art in a number of different ways, but you actually have art uh, displayed throughout the, the state of Colorado. You have a pretty extensive history of doing art. And then as you go through the school, there are a, a lot of various art projects and murals that uh, you always lead and, and you lead the projects on. And then you actually get your hands dirty yourself and are you know part of the design and implementation of some of this amazing, just stunning, art that we have at STEM. So we're very lucky to have you, but we also wanted to get an understanding of kind of your background and, and how you developed uh, this skill and appreciation for art. So let's start with that. How did you find the uh, the passion for art? When did it start? Did it start really early on? Yeah, it started when I was uh, itty bitty. As soon as I could hold a pencil, I started drawing. So it's just something I, I always grew up doing. It was my comfort zone, my space where I could get lost, um, just drawing and, and later that developed to painting and uh, photography in, in high school and ceramic classes. And then in college is when I started getting into like more painting and, and mural projects when I was about 18. Um, that didn't become like a professional practice until later after college um, where I just uh, essentially got really into Pueblo's art scene um, when I was kind of settling down after school um, starting a family and, and getting connected to the art scene and getting connections people started coming at me and wanting me to paint in businesses and the side of um, schools and stuff like that so it happened kind of organically getting into professional painting gigs outside of um, starting to teach and so that's kind of how it started. And then it kind of built up over the last, I'd say, seven years where the projects have kind of exponentially grew along the front range and clients are coming uh, from word of mouth or me, you know, applying for opportunities. And so um, outside of like the, those type of commercial projects, I've always been into com community murals and volunteer projects with students and kids. Um, that's how I met my wife actually mm. about 10 years ago. She worked at um, Gold Crown, this enrichment center in Lakewood um, as an after school art teacher. So I came in as a volunteer and started like doing murals and um, met my wife and worked with the students there. And, and so that kind of just kept going. And so I never really stopped. Um, and so it's really like natural for me to bring my commitment to murals and art making as a professional into the, the classroom in the context of STEM, uh, where at first it, it didn't happen like so, you know, overt and, and like public, but eventually uh, I think a lot of people realize that the power of murals and color and life and design as a way to infuse the school with creativity and, and make it a, like interesting and more inviting, inspiring to engage in that space. And so, so far, you know, nobody's told me to stop at STEM. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they will. Uh, yeah. How long have you been teaching at STEM? Uh, about three years now. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's talk about some of your work around, around Colorado. What are some of the notable projects that you can think of uh, where it's still on display? Um, the more notable projects are probably in Pueblo, where I have maybe a dozen or so murals outside and inside. Um, this last summer I finished the largest mural I've done to date in Trinidad, Colorado, in southern Colorado, where uh, I worked on a side of a building about this whole city block. So like a square footage that was enormous. Um, a project that doesn't exist anymore, but it was in Park Hill in Denver, it was about 10 years ago, and it was like the world's largest peace mural mm. on um, the the asphalt of an old shopping center that was burnt down from an arson fire and gang-related violence. Mm. 
um, and there's a community effort to kind of revitalize and remodel that space, turn it into a basketball court with like one segment of this redevelopment as a mural on the actual asphalt. So it was like a 20,000 square foot surface that was painted with the rising <laughs> phoenix uh, mm -hmm. from the ashes. So wow. that was a very large project. And then um, I did a Kickstarter project with my wife about 10 years ago in Colombia. So it's not something that most people could see here, mm -hmm. but in pictures, um, there were about five community mural projects where we worked with the clubhouse in Lakewood that I mentioned, you know, I met my wife at. And it was an Intel computer clubhouse and their network expanded to all over the, the world. And they had a, a headquarters in Bogota, Colombia that mm -hmm. we worked with both Lakewood students and the one in Bogota and did like this kind of cross country um, collaborative mural project that we hadn't done before. So um, wow. the, the closest mural to here is one in Castle Rock, in downtown Castle Rock, mm -hmm. uh, where I, I painted Philip Miller, who has his own park and was this uh, one of the pioneering uh, citizens of, of Castle Rock to help establish it as a city, bringing electricity, bringing um, cattle, and I think had a number of different businesses help to make Castle Rock what it is today. So. Uh, kind of spotlighted and honored him and with a big portrait mm -hmm. um, in downtown Castle Rock. Now, are you ever scaling a building to make this happen, or do you only go as high as, as how a ladder can go? Uh, I've been on lifts before. Uh -huh. I've been on the highest part of a ladder <laughs> before you start getting really scared. Yeah. <laughs> I've also done uh, scissor lifts and boom lifts, where I've been up about 70-something feet and looking down and you're just kind of like, okay. Yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> Starts getting windy and shaky and uh, yeah. It's, Who would have it's thought definitely that a little art scary. would be a dangerous job, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I didn't expect to be uh, risking my <laughs> yeah. But it's, I mean, it's pretty safe. And, uh, you know, like s people are on those all, all the time, painting yeah. houses and buildings. So for me, uh, that's kind of the thrill of murals is like, getting up at elevation, um, working, you know, outside in the elements um, or inside with people and, and just having that engagement where the artwork is being created in a kind of a uncontrolled environment where things happen and it's exciting versus, you know, just kind of locked away in a, like a room or a studio space by yourself for hours. How do you juggle time <laughs> management with being able to do these projects while also teaching? Uh, that's a really good question, uh, and it's really hard to do is to juggle, you know, both teaching a, a pretty th thorough and robust mural practice and art practice, as well as I have two kids under five. So, I, I, raising a family on top of you know multiple careers is is definitely a challenge. Um, it's been stressful. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Uh, but it's something that I, I chose intently to do and I, I don't regret that decision to, to live a life in the creative industries and teach um, what I do as well. So um, yeah, the juggling act is not easy. Some days I drop the balls and just, you know, it kind of, it's, it's rough. Other days, um, you know, I finish a, a project that um, has never been done or I, I'm um, extremely gratified as an artist and I, I bring that into my classroom and really just uh, light the fire underneath my students and, and see them kind of get inspired from the work they do just like the, the projects that I do as an artist and that's the driving force that keeps me doing all of it. What a cool feeling I'm sure to just walk down uh, the street in Castle Rock and, and go past your mural and, and say I did that yeah, it's cool. It's, <laughs> I mean, not all murals stay up or some get tagged over, some the buildings go down and you don't see it. Mm -hmm. And it's part of, uh, I guess, doing public artwork and, and murals where the, the work is going to be weathered, it's going to look different, it could be vandalized, it 
it's going to be seen by whoever walks by. Uh, that accessibility, that kind of loss of control is something I, I find really powerful, um, that it could be there the next day or it might disappear forever. Mm. Um, I think that's the, the nature of, especially murals, that is gratifying, but especially the, the idea of just seeing you know, something I created that hopefully lasts for hundreds of years into the future. Um, it's pretty, it's, it's an amazing honor, really. Who are your three favorite artists? Oh, man, that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have favorites. I really don't have favorites. In terms of, like, street art and murals, Banksy would be, like, one artist I've always followed and respected, mm -hmm. even though, you know, he's a superstar or it's a superstar, the group of Banksy, whoever works under the moniker Banksy. Do we still not know? Nobody really knows, at least I don't. Uh, yeah. But that's one of uh, my go-tos. Um, Shepard Ferry is an artist I look up to, both from like a fine art uh, respect, but also uh, transition into mural art uh, with a lot of his work is pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Another artist I really like, um, I mean, it goes back into history, but um, Van Gogh as a painter has been a continual source of inspiration for me, seeing like color really come to life. And you see like the motion, the psychological state of the artist mm -hmm. embedded in the brush strokes and the paint um, to create masterful works that I, I love as a painter, just a straight painter. So those are three I could come up with. So you must really appreciate the immersive exhibit for Van Gogh. Yes and no. I mean, yeah. I think I prefer looking at the work just in like a, in a gallery or museum. I don't yeah. necessarily need like the kind of the multimedia backdrop and all the like the lights and 3D experience. The, mm -hmm. the immersive part I think is really exciting and I think it's a good sign that art can hit people in different new ways. But I'm so old school where I, I'm okay just looking at a painting on a wall in some museum in New York and sure. not paying you know, so much for the immersive experience, even though I find value in it. Have you traveled to, to Rome or I have. Europe and have, you've seen some of the works yeah. of Da Vinci and, and all of that? I have seen original Da Vinci's. Um, actually in New York when I was a, a master's student in, in the city, uh, I was able to go to the Met and um, MoMA, the Metropolitan Art Museum was amazing and um, I've been in Rome but I didn't go to the museums to see the works there. So, mm. yeah. Is the Mona Lisa overrated? Yes. <laughs> You've seen it? I haven't but it's overrated. But you think that, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I always hear that, that there's so uh, much hype and then when people get there they're like, oh, okay. I, it's not I've as seen, big as I thought. I've seen pictures of people in the, the Louvre, yeah. in the gallery room where the Mona Lisa's at, and there's like, everybody has their phone out. And the painting is relatively small, but it's right there and everyone has their phone out and they're all looking at the Mona Lisa through their phone. Yeah. And then if you're in the back row, you're looking at other people looking at their phones, looking at the most, so you can't actually <laughs> see the work uh -huh. unless you kind of like push through the front of the crowds. And I find that kind of sickening, to right. be honest with you, yeah. that, you know, people are more about um, the hype of it, a thing. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of tarnished the idea of the Mona Lisa for me, even though I, th I think it's a good painting. It's just the mystery around it is more interesting than, you know, sure. the actual work. Are you inspired by what you see your students create? Is that one of the reasons that you continue to do this profession? Does it give back to you uh, to yeah. be able to pass on some of your skills and passion and, and seeing how, where, how STEM students can run with it? Absolutely. I think um, if I didn't have that, um, that experience as a teacher where I'm learning and I'm getting inspired by the students, then I probably wouldn't be into it uh, as much as I am. Where, to, like I said earlier, the, to see the spark um, in a student's eye when they, they find something out new for themselves as a creator is super inspirational for me. Um, not only that, but seeing the, the student's artistic voice develop at early mm -hmm. ages in ways that I didn't even 
have when I was in high school, it changes the game for me because I could see a lot of the potential starting um, and having like a potential, you know, um, impression upon that student's creative life is, it's an honor and it's, mm -hmm. and it's why I do it. So to get that back, uh, teachers don't always get that, um, that give, or the, what do you say, the kind of the reciprocal right. um, process of teaching most of the mm -hmm. times we're projecting and trying to kind of instill what we know in students and aren't always able to get that gratification back um, until maybe much later in life where students come back and say, hey, your class changed me or I really I actually listened to you. Or, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, I think I've gotten a few of those situations already as a three-year teacher at STEM, but also five-year teacher in general where students come back to me and they say, hey, Levinson, you know, your photo class like, taught me how to see differently or I was looking out at things, but I wasn't actually seeing uh, or you gave me uh, the impetus to like carry through on my ideas or you gave me the green light to just make stuff mm -hmm. as a creator and they didn't have that opportunity before because most of the time people are always telling students, you know, you have to do this, or you have to do this. And the artist's job is to tell you, you don't have to do anything other than what you want to do. And I'm here to guide that process. Sure, and, and I think so, that's one thing that's sometimes overlooked with STEM students is the people automatically think of science, uh, technology, engineering, math, robotics, and uh, all of that kind of hardware and software that goes along with STEM education. But the truth is we've seen some stunning uh, demonstrations of creativity uh, from, from our students, yep. uh, both in the area of art, film, performance, uh, digital art, Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, our, our students are not only gifted uh, with, with STEM-related fields, but also gifted uh, in the sense of just being able to uh, be impromptu and demonstrate cre creativity in a number of ways. Yeah, and that's, that's why I love being here is it's not necessarily um, STEM through and through. I mean, it's kind of the name of the school, but like art and design and the creative process exists in all fields. It doesn't just happen in science or technology or math or engineering or robotics. It's the idea of looking at the world and, and questioning it and being curious. It's just a part of art and anything else that we do here. So, you know, this the STEM student is probably more or less a person who, who questions reality, is curious and um, comes up with interesting ways and projects to kind of navigate and question the world and then come up with answers for it. And, and a lot of the projects, um, especially the creative projects, have a, a pretty exciting, entertaining, kind of special way that um, other people can read and understand mm -hmm. in the creative arts. And so it happens to be you know, my, my chosen path. And I'm thrilled to be here and keep it going. Well, thank you so much for being here, for sharing your story yeah, with course. us. My and pleasure. sharing thank your you talent so much. and passion with our STEM students. It's a real gift. Um, I'm very, very fortunate to be here and to do that. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching. And be sure to follow STEM on social media for more content. We'll see you next time.